Today's speaker is uh, Rich Banta, and uh, he's a co-founder of Lifeline Data Centers. He has extensive experience in security, in particular in, in industries. And the topic of today will be, uh, will be pretty interesting is about protection against electromagnetic uh, pores. So we'll see. Greetings. See the slides. Okay. Perfect. Okay, we're good. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, just to be clear, this is not my preferred medium. I prefer things much more up close and personal, having eye contact with everyone. Um, not to happen here. So uh, I will do my best with this. Please bear with me. So I am with Lifeline Data Centers. We uh, came into existence in February of 2001 with 30,000 square feet of data center space in downtown Indianapolis. Uh, this is a picture of one of our uh, stick-built HVAC systems. We are a high uptime, high av availability shop. So if uh, your stuff cannot go down or you have to get through a lot of audits, we're the place to be. Um, here's a picture of our Eastgate facility. This is a repurposed shopping mall. We have 90,000 square feet of data center space in there and a 4.3 megawatt solar array on premises. And this is our Fort Wayne location. It's going to be 84,000 square feet of serviceable data center space. And this is a picture of the uh, EMP shield that we'll be discussing. And we are FedRAMP ready at the high baseline. We're a payment card industry, carry certifications on that. We're an ISO 27001 shop. And fourth quarter, for those who are familiar with it, we will going, be going through a DISA impact level five authorization. A little more about me. Um, I carry some certifications. You can tell I actually really love this stuff and I spend a lot of hours working through CPEs. Um, on the cybersecurity side, I hold these. And on the data center side, I hold, hold these. And I'm kind of an odd nexus between the two knowledge sets. There, there aren't many people that try and straddle that fence. I try. I don't always succeed, but I try. And of particular interest here in my most recent on the data center side is the data center authority um, with the inter, through the International Data Center Authority. I had to publish a 60 page thesis and my topic was EMP since we were building such a data center. It took me through a really deep dive. I got to meet some really cool, fascinating people. I'll discuss that a little bit. And my other duties is assigned. I'm at a point with Lifeline Data Centers where I have a, a really effective management team. So I get to run around and do stuff and try to give back to the industry. I was recently, I recently accepted the chairmanship of the IDCA Technical Standards Committee. Data center standards, are still stuck somewhere in the 1990s. They don't take into account cloud, the layers of um, resilience and redundancy you can build in through something besides a really expensive building. Um, my thesis wound up in the hands of some PhDs down at UT San Antonio, and they had invited me to join their working group down there, which is a real privilege. I'm a member of the State Ramp Initiatives Steering Committee. This is a body seeking standardization from state to state. There's a lot of, I think, 19 state CIOs involved. And the purpose of that is to give some commonality for states to have their vendors meet the standards required and their projects meet the standards required to receive federal funding. That is split in 50 different directions and it's not working out very well. And then I also work on the IECC as a contributing member. So why are we suddenly interested in EMP? It, it is not just the domain of uh, over-the-top preppers or paranoid people. And I, I don't have a bomb shelter in the yard. Um, so an executive order came out during the Obama, nope, this, this one was Trump also, that the first one was strengthening the cybersecurity of federal networks and critical infrastructure. On March 26, 2019, he issued this one, his administration issued this one, and the DIMSO working group down in Texas is actually an offshoot of this. They, everybody, all the cabinet level positions had a year 
to um, get their efforts together and reported back. Um, COVID held that up a little bit. But th this is where we start taking it serious. There, there have been advocates for critical infrastructure for this for quite some time, and it, it is finally being taken seriously. So we're, we're going to cover some basic physics. We're not going to take the deep dive. Um, there are three illustrations here. The, the one to the left is a ground burst. It wasn't laid on the ground, but it wasn't high altitude. The, the middle illustration is a high altitude blast, which we'll discuss. The one off to the right is a coronal mass ejection or solar flare. We in this hemisphere are within the window for another coronal mass ejection direct hit. The last one was in 1859. It was called the Carrington event. And it broke down the telegraph system and set people's uh, papers on their desktops on fire. There's about 150 year statistical window on that. We are well within that. We had a near miss in 2012. And some of the some of the fixes for electromagnetic pulse actually work on a coronal mass ejection, which causes a GMB or geomagnetic disturbance. So we are not interested in a ground blast. And there are movies where there's a ground blast and all the shut the cars shut off and everything grinds to a halt. That will not necessarily be a case. The case. The picture to the right is a very high altitude blast, and it's referred to as hemp high altitude electromagnetic pulse usually in a weaponized context. So the picture there you see was of the Starfish Prime test, which was conducted in 1962. That was a 1.4 megaton device, which is large. It was detonated 250 miles up in the atmosphere. They knew there was gonna be some kind of electromagnetic disturbance. So they had test equipment deployed. Most all of it was destroyed or blown clear off its scales to where it couldn't measure anything. 900 miles away in Hawaii, there were random strings of streetlights blown out. Two blocks away, streetlights were fine. Streetlights over here were blown out, and it broke down all their microwave communications, which was completely unexpected. So that launched a research initiative, and, and one of the pioneers of that um, was somebody I actually got to work with. Uh, Dr. Bill Radaski, call me Bill, he goes by, and he was one of the pioneers of that research. Of the three assigned to that project, he is the last one surviving. I got to spend two days locked in a room with him in a whiteboard, which was a really, really good time and, and a total privilege. And Dr. Radaski is still kicking around and advocating for this and getting good things done. So since the U.S.'s instruments were kind of blown up during that test, they were looking for further data on this without having to do such destructive testing. It turns out the Soviets had done a test in 1960, and they released very detailed findings from those tests in the 1963-1964 time frame, right at the height of the Cold War, which is an oddity. None of us can really explain, but we were grateful for the data and learned an awful lot from it. And from there, uh, the Carrington, Carrington effect theory and some others were born. Um, so the blast happens up high, 100 miles, 250 miles up there. The blast itself does not produce electromagnetic anything from the actual uh, fission. Where the blast for the where the electromagnetic activity originates is when the high energy particles, gamma and others, hit the atmosphere. It's called the Compton sta scattering effect. They aside electrons which produces electromotive energy. That electromotive energy is coupled, or I'm sorry, is radiated. And it can't do anything as a radiated force, but it finds metallic things to couple to. It likes power lines. It likes Cat5 cables. It likes trace wires on circuit boards. It likes any kind of conductive things it can get its hands on. And from there, destructive force is created. Now, there was a misperception for a long time about the destructive force. And that was that, and we were actually taught this. I was a radar troop in the Air Force decades and decades ago. And common theory was that this, uh, this effect would instantaneously destroy all PNP and NPN junctions, that all semiconductor devices would be destroyed. That is not the case. We go back to the conductive effect, 
where the trace wires on a circuit board next to these components, the wiring connecting these, their power connections, the, the pulse generates current on those, which in turn destroys components. That can be protected against at about three different layers. But the event itself happens in amazingly short time. This is a graph of the waveform of an actual event. And the time slices, this is not a linear chart. Left to right, it, it grows. Um, the E1 portion of the event is the actual Compton scattering effect. That is where the high energy particles hit the electrons and create the pulse. The E2 waveform is the secondary effects of that. That's the electrons crashing into each other and creating more electromotive force. E3 is what has coupled onto power lines for miles and miles to the Earth's magnetic belts and actually through the Earth itself. There is what's called a surge and a heave. And this is very mathematically related to what happens if we have a, a coronal mass ejection. So those protections are similar. If we look at this E1A waveform and the timing on it, I, I've put a handy conversion table over there. We have 10 nanoseconds to 25 nanoseconds to succeed or to fail in protecting ourselves against this. If we fail there, nothing that comes thereafter matter, matters. To that end, we had better go into real overkill mode when trying to protect against this. One of the criticisms of my math as it was being initially peer reviewed. And, and by the way, I, I lost my calculus uh, helper. Uh, she's a freshman, a biology major freshman down at IU. So how I carry on from here, I'm not sure. She was very helpful to me. Um, but I carried all the math out iteratively to its most extreme, which I thought was the whole point. That's what we're trying to protect against. But 10 nanoseconds is fast. And to the 10 nanoseconds point, there is time domain and frequency domain in there. Th this is not simple radio frequency electronics, where anybody who's had electronics knows that uh, time and frequency are the reciprocals one of another. We're talking about time domain and frequency domain, um, which are a bit more complicated. And this is how we describe a really nasty broadband event which is almost an infinite number of radio frequencies anywhere we are trying to protect for anywhere from 10 kilocycles to 10 gigahertz. And this is how we calculate the power levels spread up and down that spectrum and how we would try to, how we propose to protect against it. So we're first gonna focus on the E1 portion of the event, which is live, die, pass, fail. The first layer of defense is, we call it the shield. I have that in quotes because it is actually a coupling device. Remember this, this can't hurt anything until it's coupled to something. So the shield is a coupling device. Picture yourself sitting in your car during a lightning strike. We are hoping it will capture, it will actually create the conductive energy and shunt it harmlessly away. Now we need power line filters because of the coupling that's gonna take care to happen on the power lines. Um, we only allow data, data communications via fiber optic cable. And then your electrical systems within the building and lightning protection comes into the discussion. Um, we have a provisional patent on the electromagnetic pulse shield, but I can say the patent covers the process and the materials to assemble it. It does not cover the actual materials themselves. This is special sheet steel in two layers, which has been hot dipped in a trade secret concoction 10 times. It adds a layer of coating, which is different in condu conductivity, but not a dielectric, because otherwise we'd be making a giant capacitor or storage vessel for potentially thousands and thousands of volts of energy, which would be bad. What our, our shield does, or th this, these two layers do, is it gives you one and a half times the conductive capability of a single layer. And it, it's joined with uh, tape that we can only procure in China because of some of the materials in it, too toxic to be built in the US. This is an issue we will eventually have to cover. 
and, and then the ceiling of the thing itself. Now, in a worst case E1 event, we could have up to 200,000 amps of broadband energy latch onto this thing, and we have to get rid of it exceptionally quickly. If, if it stays a stored energy, it's going to become more harmful as it sits there. So going back to this picture, this building, full disclosure, is a repurposed tarje. For the old guys among us, it was an airway. Um, we had to double the column count so that those blue columns, you see there, there's twice as many as we started with. Uh, number one, that is to hold up the weight of that shield. That's a lot of sheet steel up there. Number two, it is to give us additional earthing paths for all this current that's generated to earth. We then, uh, next to each of those is a six foot copper sheathed steel ground rod, which is joined twice to the column or to the wall. The, the, these ground rods are spaced every six feet around the perimeter, but stored inside um, to protect them from the elements or a cloud to ground lightning strike. And the materials used are exotic. So electrolytic and galvanic corrosions have become problematic in this design. We, we've had to take those into account. Those connections have to be joined with uh, gas brazed silver solder which is a very unconventional, difficult thing to do it. With 313 rods, this is gonna take place 626 times. And uh, it, it's a slow, painful process. And as you can imagine, none of this is cheap. But in a, a, a worst case coupling, each one of these columns or these ground rod connections could be asked to carry up to 6,560 amps of broadband ampacity. And we have to get rid of it in a matter of nanoseconds. So as time goes down to our little 10, 10 to 25 nanosecond slice there, the ampacity goes up. I had a terrible time finding tables, charts, algorithms, anything I could use to perform these calculations. I finally found a design specification for a power substation in the UK and used those calculations. The people peer reviewing the paper asked where on earth I'd got that, that no civilian should have such a thing, that it was highly protected. And I told them I downloaded it right off the interwebs, not the dark web. It, it was a couple of days of duck, duck, go search, four pages down, and, and this thing popped out. And, and the math plugged right in and worked. But these numbers, um, for those who don't work with electricity are terrifying. These are really, really big destructive numbers. Now, you would think that the shield, since it blocks all that uh, radio frequency power, is Tempest or emanation security compliant for building a skiff or protecting military equipment from snooping on uh, electrical emanations. That is not the case. The shield itself is the main building power line filters or not. So if we're building skiffs or DOD or secret enclosures within there, each of those will have to have its, its own power line filtration. Um, there are building power line fil fil filters available to do so, but they were not practical for us. I, I can cover that a little bit. Um, the filters to protect against these events are available from only one credible manufacturer on the face of the planet that we've been able to find. Um, there are other manufacturers out there. We, we have seen where they were installed and they've been placed in bypass mode before they even faced a threat. Um, the largest increment they make is 1,200 amps on lines in a data center environment. That's small. So we have to buy a whole bunch of these filters. They are the most expensive component of this entire endeavor. We could not afford to double up the price on those and um, protect the entire facility from a Tempest perspective. And whenever I discuss cost, um, Lifeline Data Centers has two owners. We do not have a bunch of vulture capital and we do not like to take on debt heavily. So we design everything from a very practical standpoint. The reason we protected the intellectual property of the shield process was it cost 1 16th of how everybody else is doing it. Um, but we had to prove that it works. In addition to the filters, I needed to discuss lightning protection because I've talked about how well absolutely everything in here is earthed. Well, 
you protect against lightning by attracting the lightning, lightning to lightning rods and sending it to earth. We live in fear of a backfeed from that coming back up through our other earthing systems, feeding into power equipment, blowing up through that, uh, through that shield. And there is no protection against an actual direct lightning strike. It is a force of nature that cannot be dealt with. Uh, Dr. Radaski made that real clear. And, and in our uh, 19 and a half year history of operating a data center, we've had one direct strike and the damage was immense. It, it is the one outage we have had in our entire history. In addition to the mega dollar shield and the mega dollar filters, just within your facility, there are things you can do. And this includes rack design. Um, for those that have been in data center and seen the data communications components, they're typically put into two post racks or relay racks, they're called with all the equipment exposed to the elements within the data center. Uh, we don't allow that for our stuff. You have to put it into a cabinet. The cabinet has to be properly earthed to full ANSI TIA overkill standards. Every piece of equipment in there has to have its, ca its case individually earthed to a grounding bar within the cabinet. And your cable selection. Um, in the data center space, we are witnessing the demise of copper as a cabling element. We, we have carriers who have chassis um, stuffed full of 400 gig cards that has taken copper out of play. Most everything new for data communications within the data center and outside of the data center is fiber optic. That problem kind of solves itself. If you are using copper, you do not want to use copper with a metallic ground shield because that is a wonderful conduction means. It will carry the, the voltage to your equipment, create current, and blow it up. You want to segregate your equipment where you have copper cable, you don't want it near power cable, and vice versa. Finally, the individual pieces of equipment, the IEC, that's French, I can't pronounce the actual international electrical code something. Um, anyway, they publish specifications for individual pieces of equipment and, and they receive ratings for their resilience against a against taking a radiated source of energy and turning it into coupled destructive power. And if you want your reseller or your manufacturer to look at you funny, ask them about the IEC ratings. They can usually refer you to engineers that can actually give you credible numbers on this stuff. But th this is layer upon layer of protection. You can't just chuck the stuff into a data center it's protected and expect good things to happen. Now, something else, and this is, this is from an information assurance perspective at two levels, um, but for us old guys, our, our backups all used to go to magnetic tape, which is completely unaffected by this. And then we all started backing up to magnetic disk drives. And one of the side effects of that has been that those disk drives are online. If somebody has hacked your system and launched ransomware, they probably just encrypted your backups as well. Um, so we at Lifeline have a tertiary set of backups that we rotate um, every other week. That's not a real good recovery point objective, but this, this is an all out emergency, save yourself. Um, the, the two rotating sets of backup medium uh, of disk trays are disconnected from power and the data cables are pulled out. So in, in the unlikely event that we do get hit with ransomware, that that one set is not going to get encrypted with everything else. But more importantly, if there is an EMP in a, in a non-protected facility, um, it's not going to get blown up. So that covers the magnetic media. Let's go back to the fact that all solid state devices are not instantaneously destroyed. However, those PNP and NPN junctions may change state. Due to the speed required in modern day storage, including backups to make backup windows, because we're all backing up petabytes and petabytes, um, I think before I retire, I will probably see exabytes being backed up we've gone to solid state storage for our backups. And these are often in line. Storage, rather than being a mag magnetic state in an SSD or solid state storage device, is state. 
it is a one or a zero state of a PNP or NPN junction, whether it's silicone or, or, or the newer variants. Remember we said that those junctions may not be destroyed, but they may change state. There want your backups. So these need to be taken offline and protected from hackers, ransom, ransomware, and ill will, and from state changing through current carried in by an EMP event. I, I can't stress that enough. It, it, was, uh, it was pretty painful to get our stuff completely offline, encrypted to FIPS 140-2 level three, and all the fun that goes with that. But I sleep better at night because of it. it it's something to be thought about. The question that the first question I get at the end of one of these briefings is how on earth do you test for this? There are a couple of levels of testing. So the IEC uh, can test protective devices that are designed to protect against this. And the filters we use were um, tested to failure at 400,000 amps to ground. I, I guess the, the failures were quite, uh, they were, it was done in a bumper and I guess the failures were spectacular. I, I wish I had tape. Um, there are test methods for protective devices that are published by the IEC. And then there are the immunity test methods for the actual equipment and systems that produce the ratings I spoke to before. This does not cover tested testing an entire facility. To do that, the standard to which our facility will be tested is MIL standard 188-125-1. And when we contract somebody, this is the normative reference they will bring in to see what kind of parameters we need to meet, which is 80 dB of attenuation through the entire spectrum, 10 kilohertz through 10 gigahertz. Um, it is impossible to test in the frequency domain and the time domain. This uses a swept, swept frequency baseband technique. That is all that is really possible to do at any appreciable power level because 80 dB takes a lot of power to test. Um, Dr. Radaski uh, was involved in the creation of this standard and, and kind of sidelined himself because he didn't like where it was going and produced this document just a few years ago pointing out the shortcomings of 188-125.1. So our facility and all facilities are tested against this standard. Does that say it's gonna survive the actual huge event? Nobody can actually say the only way to create such an event is actually a, a, a high altitude event. And we don't do those in our spare time and they're outlawed, so that isn't happening. So this is the best measure we can take. Um, I, I read through all of this, our design target was 40 more dB, which is logarithmic. So several orders of magnitude over what this called for. And we were in a trial and failure mode for 19 months of build, test, fail. You have to build a closed in envelope so you don't get wrap around, put it all together, test it, fail, analyze the failure, tear it down, try again. We lost 19 months in that process and uh, an an uncompleted facility with credit facilities for construction is, uh, that's a lot of commas and zeros. This was pretty, this was expensive for us. But we, we wound up where we wanted to be. Our original design target was 130 dB. We have consistently achieved 100 dB, 120 dB. The reason for the massive overshoot is because a baseband test like in 188-125, in our opinion, is, is only moderately effective. Number two, there is going to be degradation of the materials over time. There are going to be, there's going to be wear and tear. The waveguides built around the sewage pipe penetrations and whatnot are going to, the edges are going to round off. Those are going to degrade. The thing over time is just going to lose efficacy. So we started out way, way above spec. And there's a limited amount of testing we can do after the fact. If we're pumping in 80 dB of broadband RF power, and we fail terribly, that is enough to damage some of the more expensive 400 gig and 100 gig fiber optic communication stuff. So if we test it and we fail, it's bad. It's like testing a sprinkler system and finding out it's really bad in a computer room. Um, so 
th th this is a tough place to be. This was, these were our compensating controls and the best effort but we thought we could take to actually test the thing and to have a hope of it working. And this is no longer just the domain of us propeller heads and, and math guys. It has spilled over into uh, cybersecurity and the physical and environmental portions of data protection. It, it said in, in my bio that I'm, I am a uh, contributing reviewer to NIST 853 uh, revision five, which is in final draft and this language is still in there. Um, I know the guy that wrote it, so do you. Um, but this stayed in there. So if you're working with the federal government, this does not have to be military. This can be a federal agency, depending on the survivability and the criticality of the data being protected, they can start throwing this control on people and they point back to that executive order of March 26, 2019. So this is becoming a reality. It's just not pie in the sky out there. When it shows up in this 853, it is something we are all going to have to deal with. And I'm actually glad it shows up there. It, it shows that the community is taking this seriously. So ha having drawn that connection between cybersecurity, physical engineering, physics, and everything else, that is uh, my presentation. So I can uh, throw the floor open to questions. Thanks, Rich. Um, if you have questions, probably one of the easiest way to handle them is through the Q&A function on uh, Zoom. And we'll watch for those and uh, make sure we get them all answered. If, if I, um, if I, 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 I see a question. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see the questions as well. Okay. Arcing in between the aisles. Um, no, but there was another comment before okay. that. Let's say, what happens if you do not discharge uh, the roof in nanoseconds? It will build up a charge and there will be uh, lightning bolts and uncontrolled energy within the data center. It, it can jump from grounds to equipment, which if it's properly earthed, you'll still be protected against. But it could have a capacitive effect or store energy. The longer it's around, the more um, current is produced and the more emanations you also get off of that. As, as far as arcing in the aisles, ANSI T607D, the grounding standard, says that you will have a bonding bus above every row of cabinets and every cabinet is secured to it that will be the path of least resistance for the badness to go. Okay. I see wow. another question. The, the, uh, the what is the light? Yeah. We'd like to think it, it's really unlikely because it, it, that's almost all out warfare. We, we believe a, a geomagnetic disturbance in the form of a Carrington event is much more likely. But um, if anybody remembers two Korean satellite launches, that have happened over the last few years, those satellites are in south polar orbits over the eastern seaboard. So they're in a polar orbit south to north. Um, there was a, a space observation facility at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, which has been mothballed because that approach was somewhat blind to us. It has been unmothballed. It is estimated that both of those sat satellites had 10 to 12 kiloton yield devices, which is enough to take out the Eastern seaboard. And if you look at what has happened to uh, cloud processing in the United States, if that thing goes over Ashburn, Virginia, there goes a whole bunch of Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, Jedi, and, and a bunch of other fun stuff. Um, so the, they, we, it is surmised that the second satellite was launched because the North Koreans didn't think that the device in the first one would actually work. So there are tentatively two smallish devices up there from the North Koreans. Who knows if they work or the level of their technology, but um, a, a, uh, 
the U.S. stopped monitoring traffic in and out of its ports, so a Scud missile on a used fishing trawler could get relatively close to the United States, pitch one of these things up 100, 150 miles into the atmosphere, and, and detonate. It's, uh, if, that if that happens, uh, preservation of our data in the short term is, uh, I think, one of our least concerns. And these EMP protected facilities are not so we can continue to order an FD bouquet off of our iPad in the living room. This is so we can reconstitute our digital society after the fact. But we think a, a geomagnetic disturbance is much more likely and we have put a really heavy focus and a lot of expense into protecting against it. Yeah, I'm looking down the list, uh, Rich, and I see one that says obviously not appropriate for data center amounts of data, but would uh, this foil optical media, DVD, Blu-ray, be destroyed as well? It would not. It's as reliable as, um, as magnetic media. Okay. Uh, the next one I see is, uh, so the data center is protected, all servers survive. Who will you talk to? Who are you going to talk to? Everything else will be down, including fiber repeaters. Um, that, that goes back to, uh, this is to reconstitute after the fact. Um, this is after we preppers come out of our bunkers and uh, you know we've eaten all of our MREs. Um, that, that this, is, this is after the fact. Uh, this is critical data. Uh, weapons research data is, is uh, we're getting an awful lot of DOD interest in the facility. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as done outside of data centers to prepare, um, one of the things that came out of this, in addition to harding SCADA against cyber attack, is SCADA uh, are, are the things that run the grid in our utilities are, are going to be hardened. It's going to be required that they're hardened. But electrical substations, um, transformers are going to have to be protected. There are some easy protections in, that are available for geomagnetic disturbance. Um, there is a large common to ground anomaly that occurs in substations which can be shunted and actually this used to exist only in Wisconsin. We don't know why they went first, but um, in the fairly uh, recent past, AEP, which is our utility up in Fort Wayne, has done this to their substations. But transformers are still going to have to be hardened. We lost the ability to build those really big substation transformers, the ones that are two and three stories tall. And the United States, that ability as part of crit critical infrastructure is being reconstituted. So, Rich, are you scrolling down the questions to see any beyond that uh, have not been responded? This, 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 uh, this does keep me up at night. Uh, <laughs> I, I ran into this. Um, I, I, was, I was speaking at Data Center World in Las, Las Vegas in 2015, and we actually had the bulldozers ready to roll up in Fort Wayne, and I sat through a presentation on this. And I called my business partner from the lobby of the Mirage and said, stop the bulldozers, man. We really need to check this out. And as I began researching it, I wound up sitting on the panels with the guys that talked about it because they were all PhDs and I'm actually doing it and speak uh, audience English. I hope, at least, I hope I, I've done so today. I, I, I could relate to the audience what the PhDs were trying to say, uh, uh, the practicality of this stuff. But then I'd go out for dinner and drinks with these cats. And, and what I, these, these are the, the really spooky guys for, from the bowels of the beltway. And, and I heard stuff that just terrified me. And most of them believe that if, if we lose a significant portion of the grid, that 90% of the US population will perish within 12 months. There are those who dispute that, but uh, I, I, I tend to believe it just with our just in time supply chain and other things we, we have going on. Mm -hmm. So to the self-sustained in a shipping container, that's on the ground. Mm -hmm. There are not any ground-based devices. Um, the Ocean's 11, whatever they call that thing, um, that, that, is, that is not practical. It is practical within a, a, a 50 to 100 foot radius. Um, the, if you look at any of our data center structures, uh, there are walls 90 feet away at a minimum to protect against this stuff.
um, to Alexander Master's questions, 100% government. Yeah, the, for those who can't see it, the question is rough proportion of government versus private sector clients. Um, how do I protect my home? Uh, my computer equipment is gone with everybody else's. Uh, I have a Generac. Um, so we'll have a little bit of utility, but, but nobody to talk to. We, we won't freeze to death. Um, Stephen Mosher's questions, are any other data centers interested in our EMP shield? They are, that is becoming the case. The, the bad news is that it is not practical or possible based on our research and very hands-on experience to retrofit an, an existing data center. So those millions of square feet of data center space out in Ashburn, Virginia, and in Silicon Valley in Las Vegas um, can be marginally protected, but not entirely. Uh, that there is a refit program going on down in Alpharetta, Georgia, that we're watching very closely and they would like to use some of our technology in it. And if nothing else, the interest is in the fact that we can do it for, for relatively less money. I mean, it quadruples the expense of building a data center, which is capital intensive to begin with. Um, do, do I advocate, uh, there's a question, do I advocate prepping? Um, For myself and my family, I, I, I actually do a little bit. Nothing. I'm not one of those whack job preppers. Uh, I have a few days of MREs and the ability to grow food in a pinch and, and a planned bug out. And the satellite internet would survive. A, a, um, the, the near miss we recorded involved uh, satellites. Satellites, even as far out as in a geosynchronous orbit, are protected by the Earth's magnetic fields. There, are, there were two satellites deployed to monitor solar activity called the stereo satellites. One is in a Earth orbit around the sun, 90 degrees ahead of us, stereo channel A. Stereo channel B is in an orbit 90 degrees behind us. To get those into their orbits, they had to be looped around the moon and, and to gain some speed and be shot into the proper orbit. Um, stereo one, stereo channel A, was hit by a blast about halfway to the moon, and it was a Carrington level hit. If that had hit any other satellite ever built, it would have destroyed it. This satellite was built specifically to survive that level of, of cosmic ray and coronal mass ejection. So it actually survived it. Um, that satellite is still there giving us a heads up on what, what's coming our way. Stereo channel B underwent some testing to see how fast it could be spun, moved, or something silly done to it. It went into an uncontrolled spin and is unserviceable. Kind of a little Chernobyl thing <laughs> happened there. But the, the satellites will actually survive this and may, uh, if we can get ground receiver transmit equipment going, could reconstitute the communication system. And that's, that's the bottom. Yeah. Maybe I can also ask something very quickly. So, uh, so you, you spoke mostly of data centers, but what about uh, like, uh, cyber physical system or like uh, manufacturing uh, hardware, like that would also be affected probably. Those will since, since they all have huge levels of computerization, you know, the, the, the CAD drawing to table stuff, that stuff's blown up. Um, so the 3D printing, um, we have had interest in putting 3D printing facilities um, and, and odd manufacturing processes within our shield or within such a shield. We can't have it within that data center because of the volatile organic compounds that would be released near expensive equipment. But we'd have in, we've had interest in super advanced manufacturing seeking protection. The conventional manufacturing, it, it is vulnerable, definitely. Interesting. Okay. Uh, ah, there is an extra question. 
are there any current technologies available for generating a significant EMP other than a, a nuke? There are. Um, when I say significant, I say effective up to 100, 100 feet away at a power, at, at a volt, voltage per meter or voltage per foot that can cause damage. And oddly, in the early days, I, I was a radar guy in the Air Force, and there was a place in Connecticut where you could buy used radars from the Cold War era, 50s and 60s. And those things put out about 4 million watts, um, 400 times a second for years. They were very survivable. If you hit them with a the bigger bang and put out, say, 30 million watts one time, they're capable of it. And, and in my research, I saw a truck-mounted transmitter from a radar set of a variety I actually worked on in the Air Force. So those are out there, and, and they exist. And if you haven't built barriers around your data center, if you're in a downtown area and somebody can pull up on the sidewalk and pop it, you're going to have significant damage. I see. There is actually a Breaking Bad episode about uh, trying some people trying to destroy a hard drive with a huge magnet. I guess it's not very realistic, but. Yeah. Looks so like a that, couple more questions might have uh, appeared while you were talking. Um, it, the energy produced on the printed circuit board traces does not necessarily have to be grounded. It's uh, similar to uh, an arc flash. It, it, it will seek Earth, but it, it, in passing to Earth, um, even through the air, it, it's going to blow things up. Uh, my, my deeper slide decks have pictures of where this happened, which I think you'd really enjoy. The satellite, um, because of its trace wires, we will generate current. Within, if there's a voltage differential, not necessarily Earth, but if there's a differential between two places and you've just generated millions of volts, the damage will occur. And, and I, I heavy particles point, the, the, the gamma and, and other waves will, will, that direct hit involved a lot of those, so yes. I see a question, the material you mentioned was too dangerous to do here, to build here in the United States. Is there a way the composition or regulate, I'm sorry, to change the composition or regulation so the reliance on China can be reduced or eliminated? The, the trick is we do know of some uh, contractors who work say in, in uh, out towards Wright-Patterson or down towards Redstone in, in Huntsville who are allowed to work with these substances, beryllium in particular, um, it's very toxic heavily regulated in the US. In China, they'll, they'll make it right next to the tilapia farm. They, they really don't regulate it. But here in the US, it is highly regulate, regulated. You pretty much have to have a military or national defense purpose, which this, um, th this actually uh, fits into that. Okay. It, the adhesive used is our own creation as well. That we can make, we, we have that made locally. And, and the story there is that stuff cost us about $700 per five gallon bucket. And our installers thought it was uh, like drywall glue or something. They were putting it on with a long nap roller. That really hurt my feelings. <laughs> we, we have to put it on sparingly. Grassy, is your line open? Hey, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. We can. Yes. Uh, no, that was actually for earlier. I wanted to ask a few questions a little bit more interactively around uh, the, ele the electricity being induced in the uh, PCB channels. But uh, the, yeah, I think it was pretty much answered. Because this is a very wide spectrum um, emission, so no matter what the length of the circuit is, for as long as it is at, a, at an angle, you know, 
close to 90 degree from the uh, to the radiation, uh, something will induce. And having in mind how much energy there is, it will probably re uh, emit and maybe you know um, there'll be too much potential on one side and it will cut through to another, right? Correct. And, and at, at yeah. 10 gigahertz, you're down to some very short distances for this to take place. Yeah, three and yeah, three and meters. Yeah, yeah. Got it, got it. And, and our, our calculations for, for uh, yeah. the, the conductivity of our shield um, factored in 90 through 30 degrees. 90 to 30, okay, 30, yeah. And at 10 gigahertz, we're talking about what would that be? 10, three, that's about three centimeters, under, a little under three centimeters, right? Or about three, three centimeters, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And what are satellites normally shielded with? Because uh, uh, one would think that being there, they, they should actually have significant amount of shielding. Uh, they, they don't because they're protected by the Earth's magnetic field. Oh, true, yeah. That, that, that's why the whole stereo A getting hit was, was an anomaly. They yeah, actually yeah. with a lot of really useful data. Yeah. Because yeah, there were those two layers there that, I, anyway, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, for, on, on, a, on an as-needed basis, uh, Jerry can contact me if, if you're interested in, in reading through my dissertation on the subject. You know, I actually am, uh, and I also work with the Purdue Homeland Security Institute with Dr. Dietz, and I, I have some interest in that space, uh, survivability of technology in general. So, yeah. Okay, uh, we can work through Jerry. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Thanks, sir. I see one additional question that came up. Okay. Does, does being underground provide any reasonable level of protection? It provides some level of protection, but certain frequencies are still going to come right through it. It, it adds up. It's, it's not negligible. You would still have to shield everything under there. Mm -hmm. But that, that's, that's just the E1 and E2 portions of the waveform. The magnetic surge and heave that follow are actually in the earth. Mm -hmm. But that depends on if you're in clay or sand or granite. And th there is a uh, protective conduct, there's conductive concrete that's out, but it's more expensive than the stuff that we are 16 times cheaper than. So <laughs> it's out there. I, I, I think the prices on this stuff will come down. Mm -hmm. Very good. Perfect. I guess if we don't have other questions, uh, thank you to everyone for attending and uh, for all the questions. And thank you to Rich Banta for the presentation and see you next week. Okay, thank you. Bye. Okay, thanks, Rich. I wanted to tell you, uh, in the 70s, I had an interview with Airway in downtown Indianapolis for an entry-level <laughs> management job as a new undergraduate from Purdue University in management. You so. Or Fortunately, the job offer from IBM came came on the heels, so I didn't go to work at, at Airway. So it was an interesting uh, place. I do remember going to that facility, and I was trying to visualize it in my head when you were telling me that's where the uh, data center is located in Indy. So had to be the same place. <laughs> yep. That's that. That's it. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Rich. I really appreciate Bye. your time and, and well, enjoyed the you. session, and hopefully, we'll uh, continue to work.